Hello everyone, today we talk about German U-boats during World War II. With a bit of context, of course, it's important to understand how things had fundamentally been settled at the end of, of the First World War. But as you know, between 1940 and 1945, uh, German submarines, better submersible actually, the term would be, but English doesn't make much of a fuss in that moment, it would be an important change, especially with the electroboat. Uh, as we will see uh, towards the you know more modern concept of properly of submarine right like the the nuclear ones um, in uh, that that's kind of an approximation in the English language rather than between submersible and, and and submarine proper but this is not today's video focus well they caused panic uh, to say the least in the waters of the Atlantic sinking hundreds of allied ships. Uh, a success due to the speed of action but also to a state of art, of, of the art communication system. Right? U-boat means um, literally Unterseeboot so properly submarine, undersea boat uh, that uh, had made their the, the boat as we've seen in the Great War Germany was relatively, you know, recently developing uh, submarine uh, force, mostly uh, for their m greatest strategic o opponents at sea, of course, Britain, uh, the British Empire, uh, and um, f that was naturally, you know, importantly superior uh, on the seas, uh, having the, the greatest naval force in the world. Um, and today we will discuss more specifically what you know the, the coming to be of the so-called Rudel tactic, right? The pack tactic. Um, it, it's not really known exactly who invented it, but it would become fundamentally um, uh, during, especially World War II, the second, uh, the the deadly one that will cause, as we will see, some millions of tonnage of allied vessels to sink. Today we talk we talk also specifically of the Battle of the Atlantic, right? We we won't expand too much further into um, other you know, other important theaters of war. We'll not talk about you know, Italian submarines. Uh, we'll do it at some point uh, in the future. We focus chiefly on the astonishing success that was enjoyed, especially between 1940 and 1942, right before. Uh, you know, the uh, essentially the advancements in in rather the deciphering of the uh, the enigma, etc. And as we will see, you know, the sub German submarine fleet was operating in a condition of overall inferiority uh, at sea, right? Of of uh, access power, especially in the Atlantic. That, however, uh, the, uh, the the submariners, uh, you know, compensated for in part minimally for the broader objective of cutting supplies to, to Britain because that was the main you know, focus fundamentally uh, by scoring this astonishing success individually that however was not was not enough uh, relatively to the Rudel tactic well we know that certainly during the uh, First World War already Karl Dönitz then a young officer of the German Navy in charge of the submarines undertook an in-depth analysis of the potential related to the offensive use of these means in groups, collective training. And having become an admiral during the Second World War, he would perfect them to bring them to, to their maximum development fundamentally. Uh, he would fundamentally lead the Battle of the Atlantic as commander of the submarine fleet. Uh, and uh, as we'll see, since the end of First World War, the British had uh, adopted the system of convoys, right? Initially, uh, voluntarily, then mandatorily for all merchant ships, in order to guarantee supplies to to Britain, right? Each convoy mostly consists of thirty or seventy merchant ships that were guarded by, you know, fundamentally by destroyers, um, and so the idea of because this is the, the point of a group of attack submarines to counter maritime convoys was born already back then, right? Um, the the, uh, the, f the the German um, 
U boats uh, during the first conf conflict were smaller, right? They, they, were, they were less performing. They attacked individually, right? So it was easy for the British to respond um, collectively that way. Um, the, in, there was, in fact, uh, to the vo to to the pack tactic too many technical material limits to put it in, into practice for the Germans. It was impossible. For example, to maintain the connections between the headquarters and the individual boats, and these, moreover, had very limited uh, capabilities of ocean navigation. And with the introduction of the U-boat uh, class 7, the first submarine absolutely designed to face the Atlantic Ocean, the Kriegsmarine, already in the first months of the uh, uh, war, of uh, the Second World War had a suitable means to put into practice eventually the uh, coordinated group attack to which the Allies would have given the name of Pack Volves, right? However, it lacked numbers at the very beginning. And only from 1941, the German industry was able to provide the Kriegsmarine with a sufficient number of U boat class 7, right? War horses properly that supported the, the, the boat right, the actions to literally rake because this was the point large stretches of sea uh, with line of patrol boats properly uh, U-boats in search of the convoys of the Allies and we'll see how the system worked um, this tactic proved to be extremely effective but operating and this is strategically important in a single dimension, that is the submarine one. So in the long run, it was inevitably destined to succumb to the Allies who were able to operate in a coordinated way, also in the other two dimensions, right, on the surface of the sea and in the sky. As, as we'll see, that coordination, uh, especially with an important amount of technological support, would, would bring to victory. And here there would be other considerations, such as the fact that, as we will see with the entry into war of uh, the United States of America, uh, in spite of the impreparation of the U.S. Navy that suffered an astonishing amount of losses, but still, you know, the capacity of the U-boats to properly strike the, the main, uh, and properly to, to, to prevent the, the supply of Britain, uh, W w was ever less possible, that is to say, for how much they could sink. Still, at the end of the day, uh, even leaving aside the American and British uh, tactical and strategic improvements, uh, the, the thing had acquired dimensions that couldn't really bring to, to, to the capitulation of Britain that, as you know, fundamentally, after the Battle of Britain, was, was not going to... Uh, but for, for other reasons, so much that uh, Churchill stated at some point that the, what the only thing that had frightened him during the war had been, in fact, the U-boat uh, threat. Because, concretely, it's believed that, as you know, the Battle of Britain proved that no matter how much the, the Germans would, would bomb uh, Britain, still, you know, the, the country was one of... of important organization, old industrialization, that they could rebuild things from scratch. Supplies were the key there, and the supplies arrived uh, from the Commonwealth by, by sea. It was mostly the, the Canadian uh, vessels would be targeted to, to Britain and to other uh, Commonwealth countries. Uh, and uh, that properly would have brought, you know, to as it had already happened in World War the first, almost to starvation, because literally lots of supplies were sank that way, and in intensifying submarine warfare would have you know been an important key to to victory, but as we'll see um, the Kriegs, uh, the Kriegsmarine was not meant to properly perform at such you know dimensional level, given that. Uh, the same Hitler bas basically had surprised the German Navy but with, at the beginning of the war, given that the plans for war with Britain were scheduled for 1945, uh, had the uh, you know the, the German Navy you know progressed with its uh, construction, right? And this is a bit the history of 
Old World War II in a nutshell, that is to say, no country in the world was even remotely prepared to the war at the beginning of Second World War, of course Germany included, because Germany just functionalized everything, let's say, for, for war economy still, you know, basically when, when it had already lost the war by 1942. So factually, um, this was... Uh, a struggle lost in advance, as we have seen, but still it's remarkable how much uh, the, the, the Kriegsmark, the, the properly the U-boat scored in, in, in the process and uh, the, the dreadful consequences of them. Right? I would like also to point out that in spite of the sinister fame that you know, submarine warfare just has, you know, scenographically, let's say, um, and aside from f very few inc uh, incidents in that kind, uh, the U-boat's crews were were willing to to actually save right the crews of of the ships they they sank, they, which they did on multiple occasions. So it was an interesting, you know, the the role of Ger the German Navy also. Mm, this is renowned from a political point of view had had been important because you know also Hitler was somewhat. Uh, I can say, yeah, this trustful that he also sent commissioners to, to, to check properly the loyalty of the Navy that, as you know, the, during the... it basically had brought to, to the capitulation of Germany in World War I, while William II was still, you know, trying to continue the struggle, etc. So there was some kind of um, individuality and an in, in in independent mindset and tradition and pride in, in the Navy as such, also, as, you know, think about the Wehrmacht... Uh, and uh, instead, properly Nazi formations such as the SS. I mean, there was naturally a, a struggle between the uh, you know certain elements of of, of the German state military in, in in relation to to Nazi policy uh, and so on. But this is just a couture. And the path for the development of um, of a effective uh, U-boat force and doctrinal implementation was, was a long and a troubled one. As we've seen from August 1914 to November uh, 1918, the first generation of U-boats um, had sunk 5,798 merchant ships bound for Great Britain, uh, bringing it to the brink of starvation. Uh, a dramatic situation that the British admirably was able to remedy only in 1918, thanks to the adoption of convoys, that is, literally flocks of ships that traveled to gather information. And this not only protected each other, but also increased the effectiveness of the, um, the, the shepherd dogs, we can say, the armed escort ships that defended the merchant ships from enemy attacks. A single destroyer could guard many vessels at the same time. If threatened, the flock could disperse in any direction, leaving then to the escort the task of counterattacking. Um, the German submarines of the time were in fact still too slow to be able to chase fleeing prey. The most obvious solution to the British convoy's problem was to concentrate several submarines against them simultaneously and from different directions. But even in this case, the slowness of the means, together with the objective limits of technical communication tools that should have guaranteed coordination, uh, as well as the numerical shortage of, of the submarines themselves, by the way, represented for the German Navy impossible obstacles uh, to overcome. Dönitz's uh, analysis at the time therefore had concluded by admitting that f at, for that moment the project of an effecti uh, effective offensive use of submarines was impracticable mm. because there were too few, right? They would attack mainly exploiting the surprise and uh, they could hope to score the shot and then to, to get away because the destroyers would have fundamentally chased them instead. Uh, however, the important is that the idea was born, right? And in the period between the two world wars, the theoretical analysis and practical exercises conducted with conviction by uh, Kriegsmarine gradually made the project more and more concrete and achievable, right? After Versailles, uh, the Germans properly didn't even have a fleet, so they had to mostly theorized and eventually began to, as we will see, uh, rebuild with some kind of ghost 
companies, etc., to circumvent the international restrictions and then eventually began to experiment, as we've seen, as especially properly in practice with the beginning of Second World War. Um, so um, there are before that remained some technical and material limitations that could only be overcome by investing a lot of time right, and an enormous amount of resources in the development of the German shipbuilding industry. Mm -hmm. It was political, but the effort paid off. Right in uh, its moment of maximum maturity, the Rudel tactic, as it was called, as we have seen, proved to be much more effective than a simple group attack conducted by U-boats. Uh, and the Royal Navy and the U.S. Navy were the ones who paid for it in the Atlantic uh, and, and in the North Sea so much that the Allies uh, renamed the tactic their own way, Wolf Pack, a pack of wolves. Um, as they had been impressed by the feral effectiveness with which the German formations hunted their prey. Uh, in the early stages of the Second World War, U-boats patrolled the sea like lone wolves. When one of them identified an enemy convoy, he immediately sent the signal to the Befelshaber der U-boote, that for the sake of you know, uh, simplicity we will, we will name the commander-in-chief of the submarines, or commander-in-chief in this case, just shortly, uh, who in turn sent the information relating to the siding to the other U-boats in the vicinity, possibly with orders to join the attack. Right, And this coordination was operational from the end of autumn 1939. In those months, Dönitz, which had recently become the Befehlshaber, the U-Boote, did not yet have the ocean-going fleet it would la later have. Right, The number of the Type 7 U-Boats that the Kriegsmarine could hold at the same time uh, in practice did not exceed 20 right at the time. The operations were a collective effort but took the form of a series of uncoordinated individual attacks. In fact, still, there was no horizontal connection between the U-boats involved. Mm -hmm. uh, each of them knew the picture of the situation by listening to the radio communications exchanged between the other submarines and the commander-in-chief. And the herd thus formed spontaneously, converging towards the, the prey, and after the conclusion of the action, it immediately dispersed. So, uh, the simultaneous fighting of a certain number of submarines against the same convoy, however, presented drawbacks that the Kriegsmarine could not underestimate. The most evident one was the waste of torpedoes employed when the same enemy ship was targeted by several U-boats at the same time, because they were uncoordinated, so they would shoot multiple torpedoes for, you know, maybe just for one to be necessary uh, to hit the, the target uh, lethally. For this reason, it was also difficult to record the hits obtained with precision and regularity and therefore to measure the combat effectiveness of the various units uh, used in, in, in the action. But Dönitz was ready at this point to put his theoretical insights uh, into practice and the first German victories in Europe represented the turning point he needed to succeed. And especially after the fall of France, starting from July 1940, Germany acquired valuable bases for U-boats in Lorient, Brest, Saint-Nazaire and La Palisse, that is La Rochelle. Uh, the Germans also set up a communication center in saint barthélemy d'Anjou, capable of guaranteeing long-distance transmissions. The Atlantic Ocean thus became closer, mm, and the control and communication capabilities that Dönitz needed to effectively coordinate the group attacks of his submarines could be said to be concretized. So, more centralized command, more submarines, better logistics. Uh, Karl Dönitz became Befehlshaber der Unterseeboote, the submarine chief on October the 1st, 1939. The previous month with the German invasion of Poland, uh, World War II had begun. The Kriegsmarine had been taken completely by surprise, as we were saying before, by the sudden move by Adolf Hitler. The shipbuilding plant that it had set up in anticipation of a conflict called uh, Plan Z, in fact, had uh, 1945 
as its horizon. And in 1939, the inferiority of the Kriegsmarine compared to the British Royal Navy was clear, and uh, it would have been you know, even aggravated by the losses it would suffer famously, uh, also unnecessary ones at some level, during the invasion of Norway between April and June 1940, right? that significantly crippled uh, the the Kriegsmarine uh, effectiveness um, altogether, and for for surface vessels, most but still importantly, so and all the weight of um, German naval operation thus inevitably fell on the shoulders, capable but not omnipotent of the submarines and Dönitz was undoubtedly the best director Germany could have counted on on this. Let's remember that many of these people would, including Dönitz, would go on in um, West Germany as NATO uh, commanders as well. They they contributed significantly uh, to the Cold War Western m naval development in doctrine, in technologies, and so on, in the German legacy. So beyond the role he Dönitz played in the elaboration of the Wolf Pack tactics, in fact, to even greater uh, emphasize his organization and leadership skills, which made the crews of German submarines a perfectly trained force, animated by a very high esprit de corps and extraordinarily effective. Mm -hmm. Properly, Dönitz was chosen by the Führer. Uh, as the uh, his successor, eventually, as you know, the, as to the presidency of the Reich, and this speaks tell, tells it all, um, and uh, uh, it 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 would that, that also speaks of how important was the German Navy in general for 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 the state. So the first collective actions attempted by Dönitz actually dated back to June 1940 and had been short range. The Prien Group made up of seven submarines, had made its debut, which went into action in the south of Ireland, where it sank five ships for over 40,000 tons of tonnage. In the same period off the coast of western Spain, the Rösing group also operated, with five U-boats that sank another four ships for 18,000 tons. But it was just a dress re rehearsal. In 1941, uh, with the new U-boats made available by the German shipyards starting from May, uh, the Wolfpacks rose to 26, to jump to 64 in 1942. Overall, the tonnage sunk by the U-boats in the Atlantic thus passed from 2,171,754 in 1941 to 6,266,000. 215 in 1942. A considerable growth, uh, almost triple, but which was due not only to the increase in the squads uh, launched by the Germans, but also to the entry into the war of the United States. This navy was absolutely unprepared to counter the German underwater threat and paid, in fact, uh, the full price. The first step towards formalizing the attacks on packs organized by the Kriegsmarine was the introduction of patrol formations, uh, which meant that the ocean was properly raked by a group of submarines lined up in line properly. That proceeded with routes that tended to be parallel to each other, and the distance between one and the other was equal to double the width of visibility from turret was usually 8 kilometers, therefore a space of 16 kilometers between two U-boats joining their sighting limits between each other, which at least theoretically would have been able to guarantee that no enemy ship could go unnoticed between them. So the pattern line would then proceed by navigating on the surface at low speed, considering that you know they they, they navigated on the surface right because underwater they, they would go much slower so they they you know maintained of course also in this raking process a uh, 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 limited speed for the sake properly of you know um, in this orienting its course directly against the alleged convoy maintaining also kind of cohesion because it was 
a problem, right? The, uh, the, the greater the number of submarines lined, the larger the stretch of ocean patrolled, and therefore also the higher the probability to intercept the enemy. When this was spotted, the patrol boats turned into attackers. Right, recalculating their route to converge on the prey, right from from the line, uh, in order to cause the enemy as many losses as possible. Naturally, it took time, right, and all this obviously in theory, because even if a large number of submarines were used, the slightest human error could allow even a large convoy to escape sighting. Right, storms, uh, fog banks and currents that are so frequent in the Atlantic Ocean, as well as the inevitable human errors in calculating the position, you can imagine what, what it was with the means of the time, could easily lead to uh, the failure of a mission. Right. However, uh, when uh, the crews reached a sufficient degree of experience and reliability, patrolling could become lethal, right? exponentially multiplying the effectiveness of the coordination work between the U-boats and the commander-in-chief. I was always there, controlling, of course. So, um, how did the actions actually take place? Now, this is interesting. So, the, the first submarine of the patrol formation to make contact with the enemy convoy assumed the role of Pursuer, right? Uh, with the task of adopting the utmost caution and at the same time of reporting the position and course of the convoy to the commander-in-chief. Right, so he was the closer, so he was the first one to spot the convoy for, for that reason, um, and therefore he went after. So he would provide the commander-in-chief uh, the location and route of the convoy, number of vessels, consistency of the stock, right, so the commander-in-chief could, could decide, and the ports were uh, always remained outside the convoy's reconnaissance capacity, proceeding underwater during the day and navigating uh, the surface only at night, when the silhouette was, you know, was as you know, rather flat, uh, uh, slim, and the um, and the darkness prevented most of them from spotting them uh, visually. So uh, the information was then uh, updated by providing the convoy changes, of course which actually were carried out precisely to confuse any attackers. There were some tricks they invented, but, you know, the uh, the point was, first of all, that uh, the, the, the convoy was, was tracked in this way. And, and based on the data provided, the commander-in-chief would have calculated the ideal position of it for, for the attack, right? The commanders were informed of the probable number of submarines that would arrive at the scene of the collision, let's call it like this, and were authorized to make reports to confirm their arrival. It took it took a while. We'll look at the speeds later. So it could take days hmm, for this conversion. So when the number of submarines that managed to converge in the area was deemed sufficient to overwhelm the enemy, the commander in chief would give the signal for the attack, which would normally take place after sunset, when the U-boats made their detection. Right. When possible, the U-boats moved against the convoy, keeping it between themselves and the moonlight. This way, the dark shapes of the enemy ships would be clearly visible, silhouetted on the horizon. Once the action began, each individual commander was free to use any tactic uh, he saw fit. Right. This was, in general, part of the German doctrine, meaning dating back to the Klaus of Itzien, uh theory. Right. They they were free. Uh, of action in, in a certain, by a certain degree. Some struck uh, at long range, for example, outside the perimeter of the escorts, usually with a flurry of torpedoes. Right, so they at distance they kind of, kind of, uh, it went kind of uh, ballistic, even in water, to calculate uh, where they would arrive. Others, such as the ace Otto Kretschmer, for example, kept a strict radio silence and headed without hesitation in the middle of the convoy to carry out real massacres of the enemy ships from close range. It was a Turkish shoot. Mm -hmm. Whichever tactic was chosen, the general principle remained to attack at night and retreat by light, mm -hmm. uh, repeating the offensives for days. Mm -hmm as the other submarines arrived in the meanwhile. So think even just from a psychological point of view, how, you know, demanding 
right? We think just and rightfully about the, the prey that we're freaking the hell out. Um, but, you know, think about the, the state of constant, you know, tension in, in, in managing this whole thing, carrying it out. So at the moment of the attack, when the first torpedoes hit their targets, the enemy reaction would be also triggered. But the surprise effect, the moral impact, could be devastating. The escort would have tried essentially to stand between the attackers and the merchant ships. We would have this person fled, but the chaos that was created could be without remedy. Right when a military escort ship was chasing a U-boat, another took advantage of the confusion to attack in a different location, making the defense of the convoy even more dramatic and difficult. Otto Kretschmer, that we mentioned before, that is considered the most successful commander of the war, with 47 ships sunk for uh, 274, 333 tons, described the chaos created by his attack on a convoy as follows, quote, The destroyers have lost their minds. They launch illuminating rockets one after the other to comfort themselves and others, right, just to make the German job easier. Uh, it's, it's interesting to take a look properly at also at the, the submarines, at least the, the, most important, the two most important types. The one is, we, we said before, is the, the, the most iconic, most famous is the um, U-boat uh, se class 7, right? Um, it was the, the Type 7 was most used submarine in the Wolf Pack's protagonists of the Battle of the Atlantic. The Type 7 was based on previous German submarine designs dating back to the First World War. Uh, the Type um, UB3 and in particular the UG Type later cancelled precisely because it, it was um, overtaken by the class 7, right? The, the projects were carried out by the Dutch Ghost Company, the uh, Ingenieur uh, Skantor for uh, Schepsbov Den Haag. It was created by the German Secret Service after the Great War to maintain and develop German submarine technology by circumventing the stringent limitation established by the Treaty of Versailles. The canal was then built in shipyards around uh, the world. Interestingly enough, the Type 7 submarines were the most used during the war and also constitute the most produced class of submarines in history, with 703 boats launched, albeit with various modifications. So a bit of technical data about the Type 7 displacement in immersion, 871 tons, displacement in emergence, uh, 769 tons. Length uh, 67.1 meters, width 6.2 meters, height 9.6 meters, operating depth um, 150 meters, propulsion diesel, electric, diving speed 7.6 knots, that is something like 14.1 kilometers per hour, surface speed 17.7 knots, 32.8 uh, kilometers per hour, this gives a br pretty good it's basically the, the the diving speed was um you know less than half the uh, the surface one the crew counted from 44 to 52 men it was armed with one 8.8 centimeters skc/35 cannon and one uh, 2 centimeters flak anti-aircraft machine gun five torpedo tubes Four in the bow and one in the stern, of, uh, and four with fourteen uh, torpedoes of fifty-three point three centimeters. Another very important, another very important submarine was the U-boat class twenty-one, also known as the Elektroboot, which entered in uh, service only a few days before the end of the conflict, but represented a real. Improve, a massive improvement in the field of submarine warfare. It was the most technologically advanced class of submarines of the Second World War, right, and can be rightfully considered the progenitor of modern submarines. Several submarines built after the war by the major world powers, and in particular by the United States of America, were in fact developed starting from the study of the specimens captured in the German bases. Mm -hmm. So derived from the Type 18, the um, U-boat Type 21, 
thanks to the strongly hydrodynamic hull and the powerful high-capacity electric batteries, was able to operate stably underwater, right? Like modern uh, submarines, rather than in a surface boat that only temporarily submerged in order not to be detected or to launch an attack, as it was the norm uh, during World War II. Uh, its technical data, uh, uh, displacement submerge uh, 1,819 tons. Right, in emerging uh, 1621 tons, length 76.7 meters, width 8 meters, height uh, 6.32 meters, operating depth uh, 285 meters. Mm -hmm. Propulsion diesel, electric, uh, speed underwater 17.5 knots, that is 32 kilometers per hour. Speed on the surface 15.6 knots, that is 28.9 kilometers per hour. Crew five officers and 52 sailors. Armament for two centimeters anti aircraft guns, six torpedo tubes, 23 torpedoes of 53.3 centimeters, or 17 torpedoes and 12 naval mines. Um, so it's important to speak of this kind of second Pearl Harbor fundamentally for, for the United States as with the declaration of war by Germany and Italy to the United States in December 1941 following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the German U-boats were free to attack American ships without restrictions. The US Navy, despite the two years that have passed since the start of the war and the possibility of drawing on British experience, was found completely unprepared, right, suffering enormous losses. Four of the five U-boats class nine submarines in the first attack wave called Operation Paukenschlag, that means Operation Drumbeat, it was a kind of pigeon shooting, right, they sailed along the coast in immersion during the day to operate safely and emerge at night, chasing the mer merchant ships uh, whose silhouettes stood out clearly thanks to the lights of the cities, probably. And, uh, Reinhard Hartegen, commander of the uh, U-boat uh, 123, sank seven ships totally, 46,744 tons, right, and had to return to base having run out of torpedoes. Uh, Ernst Kals, uh, U-boat 130, sank six of them for 36, point, uh, uh, 36 tons. Robert Richard Zapp, U-boat 66, 5 for 33,456 uh, tons. Heinrich Bleichot, uh, U-boat 109, 4 for 27,651 tons. Finally, Ulrich Volkers, U-boat 125. His first action sank only a, a 6,666-ton ship, undergoing a severe reprimand by Dönitz, <laughs> for that reason. And when this first wave of U-boats returned to port in early February, Dönitz wrote that each commander, quote, had had such an abundance of attack possibilities that he could by no means exploit them all. Sometimes there were up to 10 ships in sight with all the lights on, on the normal routes of peacetime. Right? After the next two other waves, the Axis submarines had sunk 609 ships for 3.1 million tons, also causing the death of thousands of enemy sailors. However, uh, things were not to last like this forever. Uh, in May 1941, as we have seen, the month uh, during which uh, Admiral Dönitz finally had hold the U-boats necessary to organize his wolf packs, was also the one in which the event that perhaps, uh, perhaps took place more than any other contributed to determining the final defeat. On May the 9th, some materials relating to the German Enigma encryption machine were in fact captured on a submarine and delivered to the British Admiralty, providing an unexpected and decisive contribution through ULTRA, the decryption of German coded messages. With the acquisitions of this invaluable information, Dönitz played without his knowledge a game of open cards against the Allies. Their convoys, knowing in advance the position of the German U-boats, could in fact change course and escape the hunters. 
and it was precisely the strength of the herd tactics that contained the reason for its uh, defeat, right? Because the very high number of radio communications necessary, as, as we have seen, to perform the actions, right? Dönitz was able to send dozens of messages a day to, to a single submarine, uh, made the means identifiable even without decrypting. Because it, it, it was, you know, just regular communication. So the Allies installed on their ships the, mm, the powerful HF slash the uh, DF devices, or, or half DAF as they were called, high frequency director finder, right, or special radio direction f uh, finders that allowed them to determine the position of enemy ships and attack them from the sea and from the air. In 1942, 87 U-boats were hit, almost all in the second half of the year, right? In 1943, they rose up to 244, remaining at these high levels until the end of the war. Eventually, the packs of wolves had attacked over 650 convoys, sank 3,500 merchant ships for a total of 40 million and 400,000 tons of shipping, and 175 warships suffered the same fate. The U-boats that ended up on the ocean uh, floor were 783 and dragged about 30,000 of the 40,000 German submar submariners with them, right? while 5,000 were taken prisoner, which is a very high price for sure. Um, so, yeah. And we will keep talking about these things at some point. There are interesting details about these stories. Um, also in different uh, theaters, uh, you know, also other nationalities, uh, submarine warfare in general during World War II. But for now, we we'll stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.